Good morning, everyone. My name is Jeff Nyhart, and I am the chair of the uh, 2016 Borlaug Memorial Lecture. I'm also a graduate student in the Applied Plant Sciences program. Um, I have the privilege of introducing this year's Borlaug Memorial Lecture. Uh, this lecture commemorates the contributions uh, University of Minnesota alumnus Dr. Norman Borlaug uh, made to fighting world hunger. Each fall, graduate students of the University of Minnesota Applied Plant Sciences uh, group invite a speaker to give a lecture on a topic related to world hunger. With the help of the World Food Prize and funding from Syngenta, this event helps students, faculty, and staff learn about the work being done at the University of Minnesota to honor Dr. Borlaug's legacy. This year, I have the distinct honor of introducing Dr. Jan Lowe as this year's Borlaug Memorial Lecturer. Dr. Lowe is the regional leader for Africa of the International Potato Center in Nairobi, Kenya. She attended Panoma College in Claremont, California, then served in the Peace Corps in what is today the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, Jan received her PhD in Agricultural Eco Economics at Cornell, go Big Red, in 1994, and afterwards joined the International Potato Center. She was assigned to study the sustainability of potato and sweet potato production systems in major growing regions in southwest Uganda. Since then, she has conducted several studies into the effectiveness and implement implementation of the biofortified orange fleshed sweet potato, receiving support from USAID, the Micronutrient Initiative, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Bill and Melinda, the, 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 excuse me, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and Harvest Plus. In recognition of her dedication and work, she is one of four winners of the 2016 World Food Prize. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jan Lowe to the podium. Good morning, everybody. I'm very pleased. This is my first time in Minnesota. I'm quite embarrassed because my brother-in-law comes from Minnesota. And I have very many good friends from Minnesota, and I know about Minnesota hot dishes, <laughs> um, having gone through graduate school with a number of roommates from Minnesota. So um, I'm also very glad to know that there's several uh, returned Peace Corps volunteers from Zaire. In our days, it was called Zaire. Uh, I had the honor of being a fisheries volunteer in Zaire from 1978 to 82. That'll date me a little bit. And uh, one of my greatest pleasures was somebody came through in 1995 to Kenya and said, we were just in your old site and the fish ponds are still there. So I figured it's probably the mo best job I've ever done. Um, and it certainly was one of the most fun. But the other love of my life is the orange flesh sweet potato. And I'm going to give you a little history today as I talk about assuring diet quality and quantity using biofortified sweet potato as part of an integrated approach. And just to, for those of you who are not familiar with biofortification, I'll just go through a little bit of background. And uh, of course, in many of our general food security definitions, we have access to nutritious food through own production or purchase as being in the definition, but oftentimes when food security is applied at the national level, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, they tend to forget the quality and focus on the quantity, just getting calories. And I think uh, biofortification uh, is an opportunity to improve the quality of the staple foods and enhance the dietary quality of the staple foods, which we know the poorest households get 60 to 70% of their calories from those staples. Um, the idea is that you put your investment in upfront, uh, revise your breeding program, and hopefully mainstream, mainstream these traits into the breeding program. And so once the varieties are developed, they can fit into distribution systems, and you have lower recurrent costs, say, compared to uh, enhanced capsules or vitamin A capsules where you would have to be distributing them every six months. So the key questions that have had to be asked on every crop developed that's considered to be a biofortified crop is can nutrient levels be increased to high enough levels to make a difference to nutrition? And our, the orange flesh sweet potato certainly has achieved that. And will the extra nutrients be absorbed at sufficient levels to improve status? We have to build the evidence for status. 
And will farmers adopt and will consumers eat in sufficient quantities? Because you can have a great innovation, but if nobody wants it, well, we're back to the drawing board. So in our work in Sub-Saharan Africa, we started out with most varieties, most dominant varieties, for whatever reason, being white-fleshed. Sweet potato came from the Americas, just like the Solanum potato. And for whatever reason, a secondary center of diversity has developed in Sub-Saharan Africa. And you do have some yellow flesh varieties, but the dominant varieties really in the food system have no beta carotene. They are white flesh, so no pro-vitamin A traits. So by introducing this uh, new type of uh, sweet potato that is rich in beta carotene can be seen as making a marginal change. People already know and lots of people already grow sweet potato. And in, initially it was assumed that the visible trait would be a barrier to adoption. So we'll revisit that assumption later. And so I wanna go through just some major phases in what I call the orange flesh sweet potato, OFSP for short story. And I think the first one is very important for any students in the audience. And that was I call phase one, confronting conventional wisdom and what people felt about uh, whether this would work or not. And that was the first five years of the work I was involved in from 1995 to 2000 during my postdoctoral years. Then phase two I call building the evidence base. And this is really having to convince the nutrition community that a food-based approach could really influence vitamin A status. And there were a couple key studies uh, that I was involved in in this phase. Then phase three was addressing the bottlenecks. We have a technology that we've built the evidence base for, but sweet potato as a crop had some constraints that we really needed to address if we were going to be able to make impact at scale. And it was with support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for the Sweet Potato Action for Security and Health Project, which I lead, that enabled us to start really getting down and I think making a technology uh, that could go to scale. And that going to scale process really has started in 2011 to date and is continuing. We haven't achieved our goals uh, uh, that we set in 2009 yet, but I will be addressing those as well. So it's four phases uh, that I will be reviewing today uh, to give you a flavor of the kind of work that w has been done uh, that has led to this recognition as orange flesh sweet potato as being the model crop for other biofortified crops that are either in the pipeline or have been released. Now, for those of you, how many people have seen a sweet potato growing in the field? Oh, this is a good group, all right. So, because sometimes when you're far up here in the north, you haven't had an opportunity to see it because it is a tropical crop. It does love warm temperatures. But in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's one of the few crops that grows from sea level to 2,300 meters. One of the big advantages it can produce on marginal soils and our soils are not like the beautiful soils of Iowa. I've been in really uh, an envy of those Iowan soils. Yet it responds dramatically to favorable conditions down in South Africa with irrigation and fertilization and quality planting material, they get you know, 40 to 60 tons per hectare. Um, flexible planting and harvest times. Um, unlike many crops, uh, the sweet potato can withstand some temporary stresses and come back and produce well. And in Africa, it's dual purpose use, uh, being able to consume the roots and the vines. Basically, no part of the sweet potato plant goes to waste. You can use the uh, vines and leaves as planting material or as animal feed, or people can eat the leaves. They're very rich in lutein and many other micronutrients. Women dominated its production, and that's one of the key reasons that historically it has been underinvested in, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa in spite of its potential. And uh, very interesting, in the 17 target countries that we selected for the initiative for going to scale, there is a very strong positive correlation of 0.75 between population density and per capita production of sweet potato. Now, is because uh, of its features that I'll go into in a minute. 
and it's vegetatively propagated, probably its greatest challenge. Uh, it tends to be propagated by cutting the vines and replanting the vines, uh, which actually means it's perishable and presents challenges in the seed system. And the reason you have this correlation between population density and sweet potato per capita production in Africa is right here. It has the highest output of edible energy per hectare per day compared to many other food staples. And in many parts in Africa, it's a primary or secondary staple. What do I mean by primary staple? That means in a given country, you have greater than 80 kilograms per capita uh, production per year. And the secondary is usually 35 kilograms of per capita production per year. In contrast, I think in America, the average American probably eats four kilograms per capita uh, per year um, of sweet potato. So you have a crop that's growing in uh, three to four and a half months. So in some places it can be planted three times a year. So as land holding sizes go down, population density goes up more and more, we're seeing people turn towards short duration crops. So back in 1995, when I first started working as a postdoc and I saw an opportunity from the International Center for Research on Women to devise a proposal that would look at combating micronutrient deficiencies using women-based approaches, um, when I went to talk to my bosses about submitting the proposal, they said, oh, they've tried orange flesh sweet potato before and it's failed. In fact, in the major book that was published on sweet potato, it basically said they had been rejected in Africa and Asia, and people really wanted the white and they don't want the orange. And, uh, but I persevered because I saw that actually people were very, in the field in Kenya, people were actually very attracted to the orange color in our varietal selection trials. And what we learned by pursuing and taking on this small pilot work in Kenya from 95 to 97, that it wasn't a question of the color, the question was the texture. In America, we love the low, dry matter, watery, moist uh, sweet potato types. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the adults love very high dry matter, I call it stick in your throat sweet potato types very mealy, it's a bread substitute in Sub-Saharan Africa. But we persevered, went ahead with the varieties that we had, and we found actually that the young children love the moisture types, and the adults like the high dry matter types. So using a very simple uh, feeding frequency index that we had uh, for the limited budget at that time, we did a pre and post comparison of women's groups with nutrition education, versus women's groups introducing the orange flesh sweet potato without nutrition education. So that was the intervention, having nutrition education. And this was a weighted frequency score for vitamin A rich foods. And you can see we had that frequency score in 12 months go up when nutrition education was included for the young child diet. And actually because of weather and other circumstances, the score actually went down uh, in the control group where we weren't talking about nutrition education. And from that point forward, I always said, this is not a magic bullet. When we introduce the orange flesh sweet potato, we must also be talking about better child feeding practices, better nutrition education at the community level in order to get the impact on the young child diet, the increase in frequency of intake of vitamin A rich foods. And so we learned a lot from that pilot work in Western Kenya. Preferences differs. Adults want the high dry matter. The children want the low dry matter. We had tested one yellow flesh variety because sometimes in yellow flesh varieties you do have beta carotene, but it, we found out this very highly preferred variety did not have any beta carotene. So to keep the message simple from here on out, we're working just with the orange types because the yellow ones you have to go in and find out which carotenoids are contributing the color. And we found that it's easy to incorporate into young child wheat, sweet potato based weaning foods and that we could incorporate into other products like this woman is making japati. Conventional wisdom too, that was the next one we had to face, was plant sources of vitamin A have low bioavailability and cannot impact vitamin A status. This was, um, 
During the 1990s, in the nutrition community, there was a massive push for using vitamin A capsule supplementation. It was considered, there was a heavy preference for passive approaches where you didn't have to go in and work on behavioral change in the community. Um, I call it the hope for the magic bullet approach. And then there were some studies that had come out in 1998 looking at bioavailability. And up until that time, everybody had been using a six to one conversion ratio. Six units of beta carotene in a plant source convert to one unit of retinol or pure vitamin A in the body. And that study showed that there were poor conversion rates for dark green leaves than had been thought of before, 24 to one, and orange fruits and vegetables where a sweet potato falls, um, 12 to one than previously thought. So particularly for the dark green leaves, uh, people said, well, these uh, plant-based approaches aren't going to be able to give us the vitamin A that we need. Um, and there was a lot of criticism that food-based approaches lack convincing evidence. But as I found in my own experience, there was a great unwillingness among donors to fund studies to generate the evidence. So those of us in the food-based community were being criticized for not having the evidence, but I always tell the story that I spent three and a half years going to 21 different donors being rejected uh, because the health people would tell you, go see the ag people. The ag people would say, go see the health people. You know, we don't find, fund this kind of integrated research. So I found it a, a frustrating time because I thought we could do something much more significant with food-based approaches, uh, but we weren't given the opportunity to do it. So I'm always in deep gratitude to the Micronutrient Initiative of Canada and Vinkatesh Manar, which was the donor that said, yes, this could potentially work, and they became the major financing of a study I conducted in Mozambique. There was another study that was financed in South Africa concurrent with the work I was doing in Mozambique, which was a controlled feeding trial, uh, uh, which uh, fed 120 grams of orange flesh sweet potato and white flesh sweet potato to the control group for five days a week for three months that significantly improved the amounts of vitamin A stored in the liver. That study was completed in South Africa and showed that we had an efficacious intervention. And then uh, the study I did finally get financed, I conducted in central Mozambique in one of the poorest provinces of central Mozambique. It had a two-year quasi-experimental design. And what we did was have two intervention groups uh, one of which uh, had more intense community level new nutrition education at the group level plus home visits to reinforce some messages and one where we just did the group nutritional knowledge education and then we had a control group where there was uh, no intervention uh, either on the agricultural side or on the nutrition side and we collected data in this area from January 2003 to March 2005. And this was our integrated conceptual framework. And this framework has held well for us as we move into other interventions as sort of our base uh, community level model. And clearly here, access to beta carotene rich sweet potato vines and getting more energy and beta carotene per hectare is the agricultural intervention. We also usually bring in improved practices along with that. Uh, to assure greater availability of the orange flesh sweet potato year round. Critical, as I've said, is this second pathway of demand creation and empowerment through knowledge. We do have to work on behavioral change with the caregivers to improve overall feeding practices if we're going to really increase young child feeding frequency and dietary diversity and improve young child intake of vitamin A and energy. And then also, when it possible, it is very beneficial to have a marketing component uh, to encourage sustained adoption of the sweet potato, get some income earned from sales of the roots and processed products. Now, in our theory, this would result in buying more and a more diversified set of vitamin A rich foods and health services. Uh, in practice, actually, these communities we found were so poor 
that uh, really they would uh, use the funds from selling their sweet potato for more of the basic needs of oil, salt, sugar, paying school fees, and we didn't see uh, that increase in uh, buying more vitamin A rich foods. And all these things work together to give us and lead towards improved vitamin A status. So during this time in Mozambique, we started building our orange brand, radio programs and market advertising to increase awareness of the vitamin A rich foods and increase demand. This helped the marketing component as well as the demand creation component. And again, we didn't work, there's no magic bullets here. We were exposing people to all vitamin A rich foods available in their community and uh, just making it clear uh, that orange flesh sweet potato was a very rich source of that vitamin A. In Mozambique, as you may know, the dominant language is Portuguese, so our model wa mo ma motto was o doce que da saúde, the sweet that gives health. And that was on our capulanas, as you can see the women wearing here. It was on the side of the buildings. Yeah. And again, just reinforcing that messaging to the community. And it turned out an orange color associated with good health was an excellent marketing strategy. And the trait that we assume might be a disadvantage, the visible color, actually became a marketing advantage. So did the intervention impact the young child diet? We found after 18 months of implementation that the median intake of vitamin A in the intervention group was almost eight times higher than in the control group. Orange flesh sweet potato was contributing 35% of the vitamin A intake. And children uh, greater than one years old ate the sweet potato when their caregivers ate it because it was integrated into the household diet. But below one year old, there ha they had to be specifically fed and we encouraged the use of enhanced porridges. So here you can see we had statistically significant improvement uh, both on the vitamin A consumption and a small improvement but less than the vitamin A on energy consumption. <coughs> and that was basically by getting increased feeding frequency of the young children up. And then most importantly uh, to d demonstrate to the uh, nutrition community that increased vitamin A intakes led to improved status and this isn't always a given because obviously we were working in an area with very poor health services and you can lose a lot of vitamin A if you have inflammation or infection. But here when, once we controlled uh, for inflammation because of the indicator we were using which is serum retinol, we found we were dropping from baseline from 60% prevalence of low serum retinol or vitamin A deficiency, our proxy for vitamin A deficiency to 38%, why our control children stayed more or less the same. So this was good and clear evidence controlling for inflammation and other socioeconomic factors that we were able using an integrated food-based approach uh, to make um, a difference and attribute a 15% decline in vitamin A deficiency prevalence among young children under five uh, to the intervention. And that was published in the Journal of Nutrition and began to give us the credibility that yes, we could make a difference um, using a food-based approach with a biofortified crop. At the same time, as you know, uh, the, one of my core laureates, Howdy Buis, was leading the Harvest Plus initiative and they had been supporting SIP in breeding from 20, 2004 to 2009. This was after my work in Mozambique started, but very important for the initial breeding work. And also work was going on concurrently on the orange flesh sweet potato in Latin America, particularly in Brazil. Harvest Plus China started, and they did some initial work looking at OFSP. And Harvest Plus India also uh, began to get off the ground during this period. So although my work has mostly been in sub-Saharan Africa, there are efforts uh, to promote the utilization of orange flesh sweet potato in Asia and in Latin America. Conventional wisdom number three, save time and money by investing in select best bets among existing materials instead of breeding programs in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, this was a sort of 
as you know, those of you who are engaged in international development know the 1990s was one of the worst decades for people investing in agriculture, even in the United States and particularly even overseas. So you just didn't have money for your programs. And so the idea is we could breed in Peru and serve the world. And, um, you know, and breeding programs are expensive. They cost money. Um, they, they require having trained personnel out in the field and resources. Um, but I also think there was desire, even from our own headquarters, to show that we could serve the world from a certain location. And so we, did, we had very few sweet potato breeders in sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, I think that uh, conventional wisdom had to be confronted to make a difference. Because what I saw when we were out in central Mozambique, we had an introduced variety called Resisto, which is actually an American bred variety. And people loved to eat it. It was pretty high dry matter, 28, 29%. It had a beautiful shaped root for the commercial market. But by the end of the dry season in the valley bottoms, it would have no vines left. Nothing to replant for the coming season. So it was clear we needed to do something more. And I noted at the same time with my colleagues that Canosumana, the local variety, had lower root output. The resistor really outperformed it in yield, but it had hardier vines. And those vines were there to replant the next season after a tough dry season. So we recognized in the field that we really needed to start breeding in Africa for Africa because the traits we needed in the orange flesh sweet potato to make it in that environment needed required crossing with these tough varieties that could make it through really tough dry seasons. Okay, so why we were coming to that realization and pushing to try and raise money for breeding in Africa for Africa, uh, we had support and were part of a Harvest Plus led follow on project to the work I had started in Mozambique. And we carried it out in Mozambique and Uganda, which is a totally different set of conditions. Uh, it's the largest sweet potato producing country in Africa, and they face a lot of issues with virus, and whereas in Mozambique our issues are drought, or uh, tend to be around drought tolerance. And here this was, how can we go to scale effectively with that integrated model I showed you? Um, and one of the questions was, how can we get the cost per beneficiary down using such an integrated approach? So we had model one households, model two households, really set it up as a randomly controlled trial. And the idea was in our model two, we would not do the nutrition component in year one. We'd only do the nutrition component in year two. We'd only do it in year one. So one more intensive model with everything repeated in the second year, and one model with only the agriculture and the awareness campaign issues in the second year. And that study, again, found in both countries high adoption rates of the introduced materials and positive outcomes on vitamin A intake among the children and their mothers. Uh, you can see uh, in this kind of graph here, uh, again, we had lots of um, improvement in vitamin A intakes, and these are double difference models. You can see the increase in model one and model two. And technically, um, in Mozambique, those were not significantly different. Uh, actually, statistically, these were not very significantly different. So we were able to con conclude, actually, we could get um, improved status uh, using uh, and improved intakes with the simpler model, with the nutrition education just in year one, which helps us save money in terms of the intervention because then they can move on to more communities. And all this was compared to a control. Um, and in Uganda, they also did the blood work that we had done earlier in Mozambique and showed for the children that were less than one year uh, at the beginning of the study that they also had an impact on VAD status. So now we had pretty good sets of information on going to 24,000 households in total using an integrated module and increased evidence of 
on impact on vitamin A status in Uganda to add to the table. And another part of the study, which was very important, was to understand the cost of the models. Because we had no significant difference and model two was 30% cheaper, that could become the model for expansion. And we calculated all the costs for direct beneficiary, $86 in Mozambique, and cheaper, $56 in Uganda. That's largely due to Uganda having much higher population densities and much lower delivery system costs. People in Uganda are also much higher, have much higher levels of primary education, and hence the need to repeat lessons is lower. Um, and the quality of the staff in U Uganda, we could have an extension agent who was highly trained talking about ag and nutrition, whereas in uh, Mozambique we had that in separate roles because we found the extensionists could only uh, deliver limited amount of materials effectively. And then um, we have the whole concept of indirect beneficiaries. These are people in the communities that get the vines from their neighbors and spillover effects we measured uh, the cost of reaching out to the indirect beneficiaries. And taking all this information, uh, the team also calculated that it costs 15 to 20 USDs um, for disability life years saved, which fits under the WHO definition of a cost-effective public health intervention. So this study really provided the economic information to convince people we had the nutrition evidence, and now we're combining it with here's what it costs, and it does make uh, a significant cost-effective impact on vitamin A status. And I would add there are many, many other benefits that can't be captured just by money alone. I think investing in knowledge improvement, mothers and caregivers carry that over to the next child and the next generation. There are lots of intangible uh, things of, on, in terms of empowerment that you can't put into numbers. So the next phase of this, as I say, we move into phase three, and this is where we know what we need to do. First, we know we need to breed in Africa for Africa, and we were very fortunate to have the support at this point of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for the Sasha Project, which I lead, which is the Sweet Potato Action for Security and Health in Africa Project, which is a 10-year project uh, among, with 26 partners. And here we're trying to really address the bottlenecks that are um, uh, in the sweet potato production value chain. And we want to reposition sweet potato in the food economies of sub-Saharan Africa. But we recognize that research alone isn't going to get us our impact. So it is the foundation project for an initiative we launched in 2009 called the Sweet Potato for Profit and Health Initiative. And the idea behind this is to bring on multiple partners, governments, NGOs, research organizations, many donors, and really make an impact in 17 sub-Saharan African countries in reducing child malnutrition and improving smallholder incomes through giving people access, 10 million households access, to improve varieties of sweet potato and promoting their diversified use. And we set to have this goal accomplished by 2020. And so we saw this in two phases, setting up Sasha and the initiative, with the first phase doing more to prove the potential, and as you can see, really focus on breeding and pre-breeding to really expand the capacity. Because if you don't have the adapted varieties, you can't go to scale. And then we also wanted to do more action research on delivery systems, a lot of work on seed systems, because it's a vegetatively propagated crop. And we basically recognized in most sub-Saharan African countries, there was not a good functional sweet potato seed system. And then the second five years where we are now, is achieving the potential, really trying to go to scale in a massive way and reach those 10 million households. But we still, you never stop breeding, and uh, we are still working on the seed system bottleneck and also have added in the post-harvest uh, bottlenecks as well. So this is what I'm particularly proud of. 
With the support and with an agreement I made uh, with the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, we are now really substantially breeding in Africa for Africa. You can see all the sweet potato breeders lined up here. This is a sea change in the, getting the number of breeders trained and up and running, uh, whereas in 2005 we had two countries breeding sweet potato in Africa, we now have 12 breeding. That means actually making the crosses and developing varieties appropriate for their countries. And SIP has three population development programs uh, in East, Southern, and West Africa to backstop them. So we call this group the speed breeders because we have a, a German sweet potato breeder that leads our program at SIP in Peru. And he uh, developed a way that we could exploit the nature of the crop, its vegetatively propagated nature. So we have reduced our breeding time from crossing to release from seven to eight years to three to four years. And this is done by having more sites earlier in the breeding process, uh, which is a big numbers game, but enables us to cut down and get to our ultimate goal in half the time. So we call this accelerated breeding. And this is all conventionally bred at this point. And we are working with our now group of speed breeders. And because of that, since 2009, combined with this support we are getting from AGRA, you can see that uh, the number of varieties by country that have been released since 2009, um, a lot were released, the, the ones in red, in the 2010-2014 period. So some of this started a little earlier, and they were able to build on the additional support. And we have a number coming in in 2015, and then the ones in yellow, the ones that have come out since January. So we've released 70 orange flesh sweet potato varieties and 39 non-OFSP varieties in 15 of the 17 target countries. And, uh, and one non-target country, Cote d'Ivoire, came on this year um, from spillover effects from the other breeding programs. So we're very proud of this, because if you don't have the, uh, the varieties, you can't really go to scale. Seed systems research that we are doing, uh, this is um, the holy grail to get cost-effective seed systems for dissemination of new varieties and high-quality planting material. We had to uh, understand the existing seed systems, and out of this, we really developed a whole model of decentralized trained vine multipliers to get things closer to the farmers because we're dealing with perishable materials. But it has to be quality material that comes out of improved national program, tissue culture labs, and virus indexing labs. So it's been quite an effort to get those up and running in the, uh, uh, right now we're working quite closely with 11 countries on that. And coming up with new innovations that enable these decentralized vine multipliers to keep a stock of foundation disease-free material once they receive it. And this is our innovation that we developed, was net tunnels. These are low cost with horticultural netting on the top of them, and basically it's to keep virus carrying insects out of this core material that they can then keep putting into the open multiplication fields, and then they multiply it once or twice and give it to farmers. We also, the net tunnels we have found through our research with good maintenance and training can last at least three years. And roots coming out from the material in the net tunnels definitely are, um, are or the planting material has yields of roots that are 30 to 50% higher than things that are left exposed in the open for the same period of time. And uh, in our economic work we have found on average uh, multipliers using the net tunnels in their systems gain $839 per tunnel after three years compared to the $120 that are invested to build the tunnel. And most of the cost, as you can see, is in the netting because they use local wood uh, for the internal structure. Some have moved on with the money they've made to put in PVC piping because that lasts better and doesn't have termite issues. Uh, once they've made money from their initial investment. The second innovation we had that we're using a lot in our seed systems is the innovation for the poorest households in the drier areas. 
Poor communities often don't have access to valley bottoms where the residual moisture is during the dry season. You know, and so keeping planting material alive during the dry season is a real challenge. So we built on an existing uh, practice uh, that the poor households use, which is basically to abandon some roots in the field. And then when the rains come, they re-sprout and they use that planting material for their rains the next, for their uh, next crop. But of course, they've left it in the field. So often it's become infected with weevil and there's not much planting material. They get the planting material when the rains start, so they miss the best rains because normally they spend a month doing more vine multiplication before they plant their major plot. So what we did here was come up with a system uh, that is uh, the healthy but small roots are kept behind at harvest time. They can't have any weevil, they should be whole. And you can see we layer them in buckets with cool dry sand. And then we found you can stick this in the corner of your hut, have a nice thick layer of sand on the top, and weevils can't dig in sand. They, they don't have digging capacity. And then six to eight weeks before the rains start, you plant it out in a protected garden with a fence around it, and you water it, and you have sprouted roots. So we call this storage and sand and re-sprouting. And then the poorest households can now have sweet potato planting material available when the rains start, which is a real breakthrough for them. And we call this the triple S method, storage in sand and resprouting. So you can see we had to do a lot of work on the seed system to really get this investment in breeding to pay off and be able to reach the farmers of both types, farmers that have access to water in the dry season and those poorest households that don't have access to water in the dry season. During the first phase of Sasha uh, from 2010 to 2014, I was very involved in the, uh, with another team on Sasha. We worked with Emory University and the University and PATH International, which is an international health NGO. And we said, okay, what would be the next step? And that was linking the orange flesh sweet potato to access for nutritional training in health services for pregnant women in a government health service. And we set it up so that would, by linking to the health services, uh, get the expected increase we would want in the consumption of orange flesh sweet potato and other vitamin A rich foods. And this could be a cost effective strategy, but we also wanted an incentive by providing vouchers to pregnant women when they came to the clinics to pick up their sweet potato vines, provide incentives for them to be able to, to come to the antenatal care services early in their pregnancy. Because there's a widespread problem through many parts of Sub-Saharan Africa that women wait to the latter parts of their pregnancy to go for health care. So we were trying to use that as an incentive to come in for care earlier. And by focusing on pregnant women and working with them to, so they took better care of themselves during their pregnancy, we're hoping for better birth outcomes and better knowledge on their own care and child uh, feeding care uh, by the time the child is born. So it's really focusing on that first thousand days, which is recognized by the nutrition community as the key entry point, working during pregnancy in the first two years of life, because really the damage is done in terms of stunting and young child growth by the time you get to year two. So what can we do to get better knowledge and work with not only the children, but the mothers uh, and the women uh, to improve nutritional status and good dietary practices? So the way this worked is uh, we had to do a lot of community sensitization. Uh, we set up training of the nurses on nutritional counseling, providing them with tools that had diagrams on the front and key messages on the back. Um, then when the woman came to attend the antenatal care clinic, she would receive uh, a voucher that enabled her to pick up a sweet potato vines of two varieties, 200 uh, vines, uh, 100 of each type. Uh, then she would go to the community level multiplier to redeem the voucher. The multiplier would be near the health clinic. Uh, we tried to position these multipliers near the clinic so she could pick them up on the way 
to or from the clinic. And then um, we also encouraged enrollment in pregnant women's clubs, which were clubs that met monthly in the villages to reinforce the messaging. Because we recognized when you're working with a public health service, you have high variation in the amount and effort that the nurse may put in uh, to the counseling process because some clinics are very busy, lots of work overload, other clinics are less busy. And you just have personalities, uh, different personalities and interest in the intervention. And then we were working with the Ministry of Agriculture Extension personnel and two local NGOs on working on the agricultural side of better agronomic practices. There was no marketing intervention in this particular project. And we had a very complex evaluation strategy. We um, had four intervention health facility areas and four comparison facilities in two counties in western Kenya. And we had a cross-sectional approach where we were looking at women and children under two at baseline and at end line. So we could look at community level impacts on diets and child nutrition. And then we had another uh, nested cohort study, which was more longitudinal in nature, that followed. We began with 505 pregnant women and followed that whole cohort uh, through nine months postpartum. Only 384 mother-child dyads completed the study, uh, which was one of our challenges because people do move in and out of these uh, research areas, um, uh, particularly in Kenya. Um, in Malawi, we used to say the women are very movious. Um, so, uh, so we really had two different styles for trying to look and assess this. Um, because it took uh, some time to get our uh, research clearances within Kenya and the ethics clearance, we actually ended up conducting the baseline of the study in March and May, which is the hunger season. Um, in uh, in uh, Western Kenya, which is not the main harvest season of sweet potato. And of course, because that's when we did the baseline, we needed to do the end line at the same time. So we had uh, 1,781 mother-child pairs in the cross-sectional baseline, and we increased it to 2,398 pairs in the end line, and we were looking at that community level ex uh, effectiveness. And one of the challenges we faced when we looked at our endline data, because these were randomly selected households, we found that 46% of the households did not actually even participate in the intervention. And it turns out that uh, the majority, in, even though they were in the catchment areas for the intervention health facilities, they went to other health facilities, ones that we weren't, happened not to be working with. So this provided a little challenge for the analysis. Um, but we did see overall, in terms of our results, um, that we did have um, uh, 5,900 and uh, women participating in the intervention, and 63% of them redeemed their vouchers. They were able to get up to four vouchers coming to the health clinics, and the community health workers established 215 pregnant women's clubs made up of over 2,764 members. So we did see, as part of our findings, improved female caregivers' knowledge about nutrition, vitamin A, health-seeking behavior, child care practices, and diet diversity. We got a slight improvement um, in the fully participating mothers uh, attending. The number had 4.6 on average ANC antenatal care visits <clears throat> than the control mothers, which was 4.2, and a sl slight improvement as well. And when I say full participant, these are the mothers that went to the ANC clinic and also participated in the pregnant women's clubs. And they also started going a little earlier, 3.4 months on average, uh, in their pregnancy than the control mothers. So in, what we really learned here, um, working with public health services, this is a tougher environment than going out and, and setting up your own studies and you're controlling all the, the staff. <clears throat> but what we learned here 
is to get the impacts that we wanted to see, the women truly had to fully participate. And that is go to the clubs and the ANC services as well as uh, redeem their vines. The partial participants didn't see the same level of impact on the out outcomes. <coughs> Excuse me. So you can see there was a big difference between what happened with the partial participants and the full participants. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, so here, we really see that we had a significant increase in the frequency of consumption of vitamin A rich foods. Thank you, okay. Uh, in our index during the past week, <coughs> when we, the children were part of full participant households. And we've looked at this and looked at it quite and studied it quite a bit, we also saw significant pr improvement only among children of four participant households in stunting. Uh, because if you see in the prevalence of stunting in the control areas remained at 27% prevalence, and we saw it go down to 19% uh, in the comparative cross-sectional cohort. <coughs> so at the end of the day, when we looked at our double difference results, we could attribute a 7% decline in uh, stunting uh, to, to the intervention if the women fully participated in the intervention. Our longitudinal results, also in the longitudinal study, we saw greater OFSP production, greater improvements in vitamin A knowledge among the mothers, and we saw improvements in vitamin A intakes among the women and the children. But we only got borderline improvements in maternal vitamin A status and anemia during pregnancy. And we saw no improvement of stunting or vitamin A status as we did in the cross-sectional work. So this study had some mixed results. But I think uh, the trend is showing that certainly in terms of intake, uh, and getting the intake up, it's an interesting model uh, to, to pursue, and it certainly got the interest of the nurses and the health facilities in talking about nutrition, which, believe it or not, was not part of their counseling efforts before we started. We looked at the cost of doing this kind of integrated approach, it was around $110 per direct beneficiary pair and $27 per contact uh, during the study. And a lot of the cost uh, comes from integrating. We held what we call monthly feedback meetings where we brought the vine multipliers, the nurses, the community health workers together to identify the progress, note their progress, and identify any problems and resolve them. So if there's ways that we could uh, uh, reduce the need to do this quite frequently, we felt that that was critical for success of the intervention, but it does increase uh, the cost of the intervention. The other thing we're trying to do as we move forward is really diversify the use of the orange flesh sweet potato. If you look in Asia, China is the leading sweet potato producing country. And almost all of the sweet potato goes into processed products or into animal feed. Probably only 10% is consumed, steamed, or boiled, whereas it's the opposite in sub-Saharan Africa. Probably 96% is consumed, steamed, or boiled, which is a great way to eat it. But we feel with the increasing urbanization uh, to make it more convenient and put it into different foods will be a way forward, and it creates markets for farmers. So we've been doing a lot of work on food processing. Um, we're focusing a lot on using boiled and mashed orange flesh sweet potato puree because it makes better uh, bakery products when partially substituting wheat flour and it's more economically viable, which right now the orange flesh sweet potato flour is not economically viable. So here in this picture, you can see the bread that has 38% of the wheat flour replaced by orange flesh sweet potato puree. In some of the breads, we've gone up to 50%. Uh, 
You can obviously, as it here, you're familiar with sweet potato chips. You can make chips, and this is a market in Malawi where a lot of smallholders sell chips for lunch. And this is a biscuit maker in Rwanda, the Golden Power Biscuits, where again, we're replacing 43% of the wheat flour in the product with the orange flesh sweet potato puree. We're focused a lot on the baking industry because most African countries import the majority of their wheat. So to us, this excites policymakers. Really, we're doing import substitution with a crop that any class of farmer in their country can grow. We're also to be able to go to scale and meet this ambitious goal of 10 million houses by 2020. We've invested a lot in capacity strengthening. We were fortunate to have a project that enabled us to build, uh, put together a training manual, which we call, it's a trainer and trainer's manual, learning by doing manual, called Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Sweet Potato. And we worked with three local institutions for three years to get their capacity up to teach this course. So in Mozambique, the Universidad de Eduardo Mulani can run the course in Portuguese. In Tanzania, Sokoini University can run it in Kiswahili. Um, in Nigeria, it's being run in English uh, by RMT, which is a management and training facility in Iloran. And we've also started a course in Burkina Faso in French. So in the three-year period, we were able to see 4,000 change agents trained. And um, right now, um, Nigeria is continuing to run the course on its own. Tanzania, they still need some financial support, and, and so does Mozambique to keep it going. All these materials and implementation and investment guides to help people plan their sweet potato intervention are available on our website, sweetpotatoknowledge.org. So we know that we need to expand our partnerships in order to be able to reach our goal. And we also know that many organizations don't know about working for sweet potatoes, so now they have these core training materials. So just to review, you can see the timeline. This isn't something that's happened overnight. And I think I and my team have been very fortunate that we've been able to learn from our mistakes, correct the mistakes, and keep on going. So it's been a journey, as you can see, from 1995 and the number of countries that we've gotten up that are actively breeding, the releases of materials has steadily increased. We have a nice catalog on orange flesh sweet potato varieties that came out in uh, 2014. And all of this is due to be able to get this new accelerated breeding method. Uh, so we've lived through the bad times. And now we're in the good times, because in the last five years, agriculture for nutrition has come strongly onto the agenda of the development community. So we think it's really a golden time for taking biofortified crops to scale. We've restructured our governance structure in the SPHI. This is the participants at our meeting in 2015. And these organizations, I now co-lead uh, the SPHI with the director of the Forum for Agricultural Research in Africa, Yemi Akimba Mijo, and these organizations work together with us under the umbrella of the Sweet Potato for Profit and Health Initiative, uh, committed to reaching our goal of 10 million and sharing our data with each other uh, as we track going towards that goal. We've got some ways to go. We've made great progress, I think. Uh, given from where we started in 2009, so far we've reached 2.89 million households, 29% of the goal. So we have plenty still to do. This is a combined effort, particularly of SIP Harvest plus Helen Keller International and Farm Concern International and many others. But those are the key um, projects uh, being led by these organizations under the initiative's uh, umbrella. We've received a lot of key support and wonderful visitors. Um, obviously, uh, Bill Gates came out and announced this project at the World Food Program in 2009. That's when they funded Sasha. They've come out to visit it. We had a surprise visit from Bono in the field, and he was very excited to see a variety named Gaba Gaba, uh, because apparently that's part of a refrain in a Ramon song, and he's been a big supporter of the Ramones. 
Uh, we have a lot of support also from DFID, Maria Andrade, my core laureate, and Howdy Buis were involved in the nutrition summit linked to the Olympics when it was held in Britain that supported a lot of our going to scale work. And the president, uh, Kibaki, for the biotechnology work we're doing in Kenya has been a great supporter as well. And recently, uh, in the January 2015, we received a call out of the blue from Nan Anan, who is the spouse of Kofi Annan, who I'm sure most of you know uh, led the UN for many years. And, and Kofi Annan's from Ghana. And she says, I really want to get orange flesh sweet potato moving in Ghana, and we want to help you. So they visit us now four times in Ghana and have really helped start moving the West African program uh, dissemination efforts uh, farther ahead. So we're very appreciative of the support we're getting and the increased awareness of the potential benefits of orange slash sweet potato in many different countries in Africa. And we much appreciate the recognition that we recently received from the World Food Prize. If I can I introduce my co-laureates. This is Robert Mwanga, who's been breeding for over 20 years in Uganda and has come up with some of the best virus-resistant varieties that we're, we have in use now in Central Africa and East Africa. Maria Andrade, my colleague, who's been 20 years in Mozambique. She's from Cabo Verde. And many of you know Howdy Buas from Harvest Plus. We've collaborated and worked closely together for all of these years as well. So I'll stop here. I think I'm on time. Thank you very much.